Again, welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Mizani. I am uh, the uh, founding president of AC Medical, and we've been doing this since uh, uh, I was a senior medical student. I was the first client of our organization, and you know, I figured if I needed the help, there's probably others that need it, and, and here we are today. So every day, about 25,000 patients are treated by our alumni, and so we're quite proud of that, and we want to keep that tradition going. Supplemental offering acceptance program is quite you know, near and dear to my heart because uh, that's how I got into residency. You know, I didn't have the best mentors out there, but uh, you know, once I did, I kind of figured my way around and, and managed to help others as well. So I hope that we'll be able to do it and uh, you can walk away with some really good uh, information here today and, and be able to have a fruitful supplemental offering acceptance program and match results like, uh, like I did last minute. As you can see, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we like to record these so that uh, we can go ahead and post them on our YouTube channel and other media so that we can share it with the world. And so if you, uh, you, know, you, you don't have to say anything, and you know, so your privacy is pretty well maintained. Um, uh, but if you, if, you, uh, you know, if you raise your hand or if you have a live question, then of course your name may come up. Um, so, uh, but you know, that may not be that important to you, but I'm open to, uh, I would like to answer questions at the end. I really like the, uh, the live session at the end where we interact and, and I speak with you directly. So please go ahead and, uh, if I didn't answer your questions that you, uh, that you put in the registration form, please go ahead and raise your hand and I'll be more than happy to go ahead and cover it, um, uh, towards the, uh, uh, the end. There's some housekeeping items. Uh, the residency prep academy gets better and better every single day. Uh, the search functionality gets better. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of information there that you're going to find. Uh, beneficial. So uh, please go ahead and check it out. It's acmedical.org forward slash uh, academy. And uh, our Future Docs podcast has been uh, on a little bit of a hiatus in the past uh, uh, month uh, just because uh, we're getting ready for supplemental offer and acceptance program. But in its place, we have uh, several webinars that we're posting. And so, uh, you know, take advantage of those. Our podcasts are uh, going to go uh, get back on track in about a week and a half. Any past videos uh, that you can also access by going to Academy and going to the video section. And uh, of course, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We really appreciate your support. If you, any of you are, is not an AC Medical member, you can try us for free. You can speak with me. You can speak with one of our enrollment consultants. And um, you know, we'll spend uh, you know we'll spend the time that's necessary to to answer your questions one on one. Or if you want to speak with me, we'll give you a one time office hour access pass and. And you get to see our uh, office hours work and, and our members uh, uh, benefit from uh, meeting with us. And of course, uh, AC Medical uh, members, your, your outcomes are very, very important to us. We keep track of those. Uh, that's how we know uh, how many of our members have matched and how many have secured interviews. And so uh, if, if you have not uh, done so, and if you're an AC Medical member, uh, please go to acmedical.org forward slash my outcomes by uh, April 25th before 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And just enter each one of your interviews and where you match and each one of your entries equals one chance to win one of the five one hundred dollar uh, amazon gift cards and we give all of them away uh, every year and then we we post the the winners uh on online and so you'll get to see how they're selected so please go ahead and fill that out and and um, it's an easy one hundred dollars that you could uh, you could walk away with for this year we uh, we started four complete prep packages and you can select by how many letters of recommendation you need how many how much is your budget? Uh, if you're looking for a specific residency affiliation, uh, or or just a clinical site that is affiliated with a residency program or a teaching hospital, or generally just location and by by regions, and so you can you know we have packages for each one of those, and so please check out uh, acmedical.org forward slash promo and uh, see our latest promos there. We're not affiliated with any of the organizations uh, that uh, you see here: ACTV, ERAS, ECFMG. We're completely independent. And um, any of the um, uh, any of the registered trademarks are uh, the, they belong to their respective um, uh, trademark holders, and they're not affiliated with AC Medical. Uh, and um, if you have any red flags in your residency application, and uh, such as for example USMLE failures, gaps uh, during or after graduation, if you've got any history of an unsuccessful match, uh, if you transferred medical schools, if your exams have expired, and you're thinking about retaking them, and ECFMG is is allowing you to retake it and if you wonder whether that's going to be an extra attempt um, if you've uh, secured residency and then you've been terminated or you've left before the completion of that residency if you've been involved in a match violation if there's been any sort of investigation whatsoever uh, by any of the, uh, the, the authorities within the match we strongly recommend that you seek uh, professional advice and, and counsel immediately and it doesn't have to be in the form of an attorney um, you can um, uh, you know you have to identify somebody who's been through a situation like that uh, to go to mentor you and uh, if you want to go ahead and cut through all the chase and 
and uh, not have to worry about who it is that you have to find, you can come to us and we've uh, pretty much been through any scenario that you could think of uh, that a presidency candidate has, uh, has experienced. Um, so uh, we have experience in almost any uh, red flag uh, areas. And so please go ahead and sign up for trials for free and, and let's see how we can uh, address your red flags. So this is our 45, uh, selecting 45 programs in the SOAP interview prep uh, webinar. Uh, and we're going to uh, start in just uh, one minute. Thank you. All right. As uh, always, I'd like to uh, start with the uh, questions that you have uh, asked during your registration form. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and share some of those with you. And, uh, and we're going to go ahead and try to touch up on every single one of these throughout the presentation. Do you recommend applying uh, for a transitional year, if so, in SOAP, if uh, I want family medicine? And is it, will it help uh, an old international medical graduate if if we could not get a categorical to do transitional one year and then apply next year for a categorical advanced family medicine, uh, we get asked this question all of the time, and uh, it's a very, very good question. It's a you know a confusing scenario to be in, and of course uh, you you will wonder you know whether doing one year is better than doing nothing. So we'll uh, we'll cover that uh, under the category of uh, programs to apply to. Next question is uh, you know uh, how do I optimize my chances of receiving calls and uh, and offers during so open? And of course, by selecting the type of program, that's one of it. Uh, hopefully, you've attended our previous uh, webinars and you've uh, you know you've either joined AC Medical uh, and become a SOAP member so that we could we could have prepared you for this moment, and 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 many of you have, and we certainly appreciate that, and we're going to stay by your side every single moment of the process. Um, but uh, but if you haven't, hopefully you've uh, watched our webinars and you're doing the best that you can. And so this is just a part of that optimization. Uh, so once you certify your application, and then you're two weeks away from supplemental offer and acceptance program. Number one, make sure that today, March 1st, you're, uh, if you have any interviews that you certify that rank order, that's number one. Hopefully you don't have to go through supplemental offer and acceptance program, but if you do, uh, then then of course, this is one of the final things that you could do by being here today in the type of program that you select uh, in, um, in, in who potentially will call you. Uh, other questions uh, that um, were asked, of course, you know, what programs to apply to uh, during SOAP. Another uh, really good one that was asked is, as a candidate with nothing to update on application, how can I increase my chances? Um, great question. You know, one of the uh, one of the, uh, the advices that, uh, that we give uh, to all of our members, like right now, those that are applying to the 2024 match, is apply as if you're not uh, going to match and you have to SOAP. And so we, we prepared you about a year and a half in advance for a scenario like this. So that's one of the ways to have avoided this. But if you've already certified and here you are, then uh, making sure that, uh, you know, reviewing your application and whether it makes sense, uh, whether everything is consistent, and you got to kind of follow that through in supplemental offer and acceptance program. It's a little bit tricky uh, because we need to see what specialty you committed yourself to before you certified your application, and then you got to kind of follow that through. But we'll definitely cover those in, in, in this webinar. Uh, best way to approach programs and how to apply to programs. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question, actually. So just uh, we don't cover how to apply to programs, but it is a, it is a good question to, to answer. So covering pro applying to programs is not through NRMP. NRMP just lists the, uh, the programs that happen to be unfilled. And that's so you take. You, you have to also be registered with ERAS. And um, as you register with ERAS, you have to go find that program that is unfilled on ERAS. So you have both of the, uh, the portals open and you go to ERAS and then you find that program and then you add that to your cart and you start to um, attach supporting documents to that program and then that's how you apply. Uh, another good question was, you know, how to prep for SOAP interviews and common interview questions. How, how do you find programs that have free spots? And of course, that's by you logging into your portal. This year is different because they're not going to send an email beforehand telling you whether you match or not. You're, they're asking you to go and log into the portal that, that they have uh, matched week to see if you matched or not. And, and of course, in this whole presentation, we're assuming that you're match eligible. And so your eligibility is determined by you having to pass your USMLEs and, and, and you know, we've had ECFMG, uh, or at least our members are reporting to us that ECFMG has told them both, you know, as long as you pass your USMLEs before match week. Uh, yesterday, uh, we actually saw a copy and paste of the message that ECFMG has sent one of our members that said that it has to be done by March 1st, where you pass all the USMLEs and, um, and uh, your ECFMG uh, certifiable. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure where the miscommunication comes from, but that's why you should always contact ECFMG yourself or your medical school dean if you're a U.S. medical senior or graduate and, uh, and, and, and ask them because this information changes, especially by the time it gets to us 
So, uh, so make sure that you call them for very critical questions like that. Another really good question was, uh, shall I choose the 45 programs uh, and that, um, you know, right there from the start and, and apply to all 45 in the beginning, or should I kind of spread it out? And, you know, uh, you, you, you want to, uh, you want to, you want to apply immediately uh, as soon as you can, uh, which is uh, on Monday. Uh, and I believe it is at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we can go ahead and just uh, confirm that. So that'll be 2023 match week schedule. And uh, you all can do this as well. And so, and then you look at the right here, 2023 match week calendar. So yeah, it's 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's when uh, ERAS opens uh, my ERAS for soap applicants and can start preparing the application and submitting it. And programmers won't be able to see it until 8 a.m. Eastern Time the next day. We have the entire day to do it, but 11 a.m. March 13th is like uh, September 28th uh, at uh, you know 9 a.m. where programs start to download uh, the uh, the applications and and you don't you want to you want to submit it as soon as you can closest to 11 o'clock because you know it goes in it goes in a queue uh, and so programs will start to download the program uh, the applicants based on queue. so you don't want to spread this out through you know 13 14 15 16. Uh, I, programs are going to get so many applications that they just won't have the time to look at new ones coming in. So they'll they'll pick the first few that that they feel like has the least amount of red flags, and uh, they'll they'll start contacting them. Okay, so this is the 2023 uh, match week. Uh, uh, let's, let's go back. So I uh, I typed in 2023 match week schedule, and you come through the calendar, and here is the. Soap schedule, and uh, you uh, click it, and, and this opens up. So, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is when programs, uh, when you can start submitting applications, a program at 8 a.m. can open up their program director workstation to begin reviewing the applications. So, the closer you submit your application to 11 a.m., the higher in the queue you will be. Uh, and you don't want to spread it out over the 14th, 15th, 16th. You know, theoretically, programs will make phone calls during these times. Uh, I have never been. Um, involved in a scenario like that where uh where uh, i've seen a candidate be called during so round, but you know they can they, they they have the right to do it uh, and they potentially could if they have questions uh but uh, this is 14th and 15th is where all, all of the, the calls are going to take place and all the uh you know the the, the suit talking and the interview questions are going to happen during these times uh so um so yeah so those are really uh the, the best questions that uh, that i saw in the registration if there's a question that you have that I did not cover, please make sure that you ask it uh, in uh, in the chat session or better yet, raise your hand so I can speak with you and, uh, and go from there. So how do you apply to programs? All right, so for our AC Medical SOAP members, I keep bringing this up because there's a lot that goes into SOAP preparation. I, I didn't even know that when, when I uh, when I did a match, but um, I, I got to learn it pretty quickly. So with our AC Medicals that are SOAP members, uh, what we've done is we do a SOAP strategy. So those AC Medical SOAP members, please make sure that you go through all of your SOAP strategy notes with us and, uh, and follow those recommendations because there we, we finalize what specialty you should apply to, how many of the 45 programs you should apply to which, how many of them should you apply to other. We have a first specialty, second specialty. SOAP is the only time that uh, we recommend a first and a second specialty. And there's a reason for that is because, again, this is only for SOAP is because uh, we don't know what's going to happen year to year these numbers change and uh, you know these trends you 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 may have uh, um you know in one year you may have uh, emergency medicine for example uh, it's always historic they have maybe one two or three programs that were unfilled uh, this past year they had uh, over 60 programs that were unfilled and so that was a that was you know a tremendous negative uh, swing for er programs great for us uh, but it was not good for them uh, family medicine every year has just been climbing the number of unfilled programs and um, you know that that may change uh, family medicine may uh, you know, again it may change uh, internal medicine categorical kind of been on the up uptick as well but internal medicine preliminary for example that's been down so that's why you need the first and second specialty but but some strategy notes uh, please make sure that you take a look at that and and see what our recommendation was all right so let's say that this is for all of you uh, members or not think of Think of the, the call that you're going to get. Let's say that you know, forget about how to strategize and which programs that you call. You want to make sure that you can you know, hold your own in, in these uh, in this first phone call that, that you're going to receive. And the first the, the first thing that these programs want to know is that are you going to be able to survive where they are? Are you going to be happy? Uh, and they're going to look for signs of, of whether there's a, there's a match. So, for example, when I was going through, um, uh, it was called Scramble when I when I went through it. 
the uh, I ended up getting seven offers uh, during uh, Scramble, and uh, the one that I uh, selected was in Rome, Georgia, which was an hour away from Atlanta because of my support system and the program director loved it. They just ate it up. I felt good because I was only an hour away from my mentor. And when I did my clinical rotation with my network was really strong. And so the interview went really well um, on the phone. And uh, I had my mentor from Atlanta call. He was the former chief of Morehouse. And, you know, it was just fantastic. It was really good. Uh, so if you have a support system like that and uh, and you can identify programs that are unfilled in, in those areas, then you definitely want to go in and, and, and apply. And of course, there's got to be the specialty in that area too. So family support system is important, uh, even social support system. I mean, you don't have to have like a flock of friends, right? You don't have to have, um, you know, you don't have to have, uh, you know, five or 10 family members living there. It, it could it could just be anybody, even one person, you, know, you may need to think hard, maybe somebody that you haven't visited in 10 years. But as long as you have one person there, then you can actually say it. Uh, I will tell you that one of our members uh, did say that, and she was in an interview, and the um, the interviewer called her out, and uh, he said, uh, "Where in Virginia?" And uh, she she paused for a second, and she said, "Can I check my phone?" Which was a smart thing to do. And so she opened up her phone and she uh, checked, and it was Virginia Beach. And she said, and he said, "Well, you know, that's not really where we are. That's about three hours away." But it was true, so there was no you know there was no falsified information. So just be ready for that next step. So you're doing all of this to make sure that you do well in that phone call and uh, and you don't get embarrassed and you don't miss this once in a lifetime opportunity. And even, you know, if, if you don't have any of these, let's say that you're, uh, you've are you never, you know, you've just come to the United States a couple of times to, to visit Disneyland or maybe do a clinical experience, you know, I suppose that could work. But, you know, the farther away you get from, you know, really meaningful support system, the, the more holes that they can poke in, in uh, your uh, eligibility or qualification to uh, to receive an offer from that program. So first thing is identify programs and what, what states they're in, and then immediately start thinking, where do I have friends? Where do I have family? Try to leave that place that you visited to to absolutely last, you know, a final need if you absolutely need to. States where you completed your clinical experiences, uh, your clinical clerkships, your externships, your electives, and uh, just like myself, I did about uh, 11 weeks of rotations in, in Elgin, Illinois, and, and I, uh, my school transferred me to Atlanta. And, and I stayed in Atlanta for you know, seven years after that. And not only did I do that, I, I did residency in Rome, Georgia. Then I did my second and third year in Atlanta, Georgia. I stayed there for another year. Um, you know, I was at the, the, the airport, the uh, Hartsfield-Jackson uh, Reagan Memorial System uh, urgent care position after my residency. And so it was, you, know, you just stay there, you build your network and it's kind of hard for you to meet. And you, you, especially in medicine, it's all about network and who you know and who you're collaborating with. It just feels good to practice where, where you know a lot of people. So we tend to stay where where we do our clinical rotations to, to kind of do residency. Then programs kind of know that. And programs want to keep you after residency because they get a lot of subsidies. They state medical boards keep track of. And so, you know, programs know that and they want to keep you there so you can make sure that your um, the phone call that you have with them, you emphasize on on the, the strength that, look, I've already experienced uh, how the healthcare system is here. And I know some of the physicians in preferably in the city that, that there is an unfilled uh, spot in. And, uh, and, and they, they love it. They're going to eat that up too. So when you've done your clinical experiences uh, is is important, and it becomes a quite a quite a, a big seller uh, during the phone call like that. And, and you know, you only get about four or five minutes uh, in these phone calls. Uh, hopefully, if it gets to four or five minutes, and you want it to be about things that you're comfortable with. So if you bring up something like this, and they're in that state, boy, that could take up you know that could take up 50, 60 percent of that five minutes, and you're good to go. So the next step is you know, speak with the program director. You know, maybe. You know, another second call with another second or third call, and it just progresses that way. My specialty. So, as as I mentioned before, you know, during during the regular math cycle, our recommendation is not for anyone to apply to multiple specialties unless there is a really really good reason. So let's go ahead and take uh, U.S. medical seniors for example. The medical school advisors in the United States have the have a bad habit of telling their medical students to you know pick. Pick the specialty that you know that that is most likely that you can imagine and you're going to be happy in. But you know you can also pick that reach specialty and uh, and and see what happens. And you know they kind of do that to not uh, you know break their heart and not to tell them oh you're not going to be a neurosurgeon or you're not going to be a family physician. They they kind of let the the, the match algorithm do that uh, that uh, 
that tough work and and uh, and give that tough love to them without them uh, looking bad. Uh, but what what they don't tell us, and, and so what happens, by the way, is that the Caribbean medical school advisors and and many of these other medical schools across the world that have uh, that have an English program, what they do is they give the same advice to us when we go there, and they say, oh, you know, pick a, a specialty and pick a backup specialty, and, and there could be nothing worse than that during the regular max cycle because because commitment to specialty is critical. So let's fast forward to soap. Um, so in soap, it's different because if family medicine had 170, say six programs that were unfilled in 2022 match, that number could drop to 20 this year. And so what are you gonna do if that happens? And you can apply to 45 programs. So if you can apply to 45 programs, you apply to 20 of them, assuming, let's just say, I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't know Chris Crystal Ball, but let's say it happens. Uh, and uh, what are you going to do if you have another 25 programs you can apply to? So you're going to scramble last minute. And so you don't want to do that. And that's where our, our soap strategy sessions, you know, we really start to design personal statements for first specialty and the second specialty. We start to talk about it. We start to strategize. We meet the morning of match week to see what has happened and whether we need to modify those strategies. And so you have to be flexible. So your preferred specialty during the regular match may not be the same specialty that you apply to, or you, you have a chance in during soap because there may not be that many unfilled um, positions in that specialty. So keep that at the forefront of your mind. And um, you know, so that historical data from soap is it's a positive indicator for what could happen, but when there is a swing, it's tremendous. Or, or it could be just a little bit, but it, it, it should, you should have a backup plan. Even with internal medicine categorical, uh, I, I remember with family medicine, it used to be in the 30, 25 to 30 program that was unfilled each year. This is new. Ever since the uh, single accreditation system in 2015, ever since that had started happening, where osteopaths and, and allopaths, they joined together under ACDME, that's when we started seeing all of these unfilled positions in family medicine just skyrocket. Again, it's really good for, for us because it means there's more options for in the, in the specialties that we like to match into most. So prepare, go ahead and open up um, ERAS's, uh, uh, you know, let me go ahead and show this to you right now. You can access all of this yourself too, and that's the reason why I'm sharing these with you. So I'd like to go to NRMP's uh, website again. You go to uh, match and match data and analysis, and you click on residency data and reports, and you open up results and data of the 2022 match, and you search for SOAP, and you see, and it kind of, kind of go up, and this is where you see the 2021 versus 2022 comparisons. And this is that emergency medicine that I was telling you, look, it was went from four to 67 programs on field. It, it just blew our minds away. Family medicine went from 129 to 176. 176 unfilled programs. That's, what is that? That's, that's, is that 20%? Yeah, that's 20% of family medicine programs that were unfilled. Uh, but now here, uh, internal medicine went to 88. It's going to drop down to 40. Like like here, uh, preliminary went from 75 down to 46. So if you have 45 programs, what are you going to do? So anyway, that's what that's what uh, by specialty you need to kind of be ready for that uh, specialty uh, A and specialty B. So let's go to the next uh, strategy and how to um, pick your 45 programs. So let's say by category, and this is the the question that our um, uh, audience uh, had asked, you know, do I, do I focus on transitional, do I focus on preliminary, get one year out of the way and then apply to categorical? You know, you could, you could certainly do that. And, uh, you know, sometimes I make that recommendation if there's a lot of red flags in, in a candidate's application, because I want to see them get in. If, if there's a lot of red flags, let's say, and when I say a lot of red flags, I mean a lot of red flags, like, um, let's say three attempts on, on a single USM, I mean, they test or usually it's multiple attempts. I'm, not, I'm never worried about scores. I'm never, um, I'm not too worried about uh, year of graduation. I'm not too worried about that because if, 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 if it's our own member, because I know that, that we're gonna, it's, it's, the, it's the way your application looks. So let me, let me get back over here. I wanna make sure that I stay on track. Transitional and preliminary, the whole idea of transitional and preliminary is to serve as the first year of residency for an advanced specialty. Okay, that's the whole point of preliminary and transitional is for advanced specialty. I'm going to tell you the exceptions towards the end, but if you're going through so and you apply to preliminary thinking that, okay, well, it's a one-year residency and I'm going to, at least I want to get something. These preliminaries, some of them would rather keep it empty than to bring somebody on there that does not have an advanced specialty. 
because um, because they don't want to because you, you you can do very little with that one year as a as a practicing physician. Uh, there are some states where you could get a, a licensure, but again, getting malpractice insurance is going to be an issue. Uh, finding a job with only one year residency is going to be incredibly difficult if you're not uh, board eligible. So under normal circumstances, I would not recommend that. There are some strategies that we've had with with some of our SOAP members where we've done a combination of categorical and prelim, but those are very strategic moves and, and it's very case by case basis and an individualized recommendation. Usually I do not recommend that you apply to prelim and transitional. Um, an exception to that is surgery. Um, exception to this, this is surgery where, uh, you know, I, one of our members, I, I was uh, WhatsApping yesterday, you know, he, he started with preliminary surgery. He matched uh, with some red flags and he matched. I was really happy that he matched, but prelim surgery. They offered him a second year prelim surgery. He did a second year prelim surgery and program. Still, so what, what we were waiting for is that a, a spot becomes open in second or third year so that they would just kind of you know, squeeze him in. It did happen, they didn't pick him. So then they said, okay, we'll give you for one more year here, but they put him in, um, in um, I won't tell the department just because I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want it to be identifiable, but he's not even considered, uh, they, they, they're working him like a resident, but he's not even categorized as a resident. So these these preliminaries can become very, very tricky. And, and you know, it, you could feel like, Man, I, I'm I'm like a hostage here, and I can't go anywhere. And I and I and I keep I keep chasing after the a spot. Somebody messing up so that I can go in and fill their position. And it's a it's a pretty tough life to live. Uh, but assuming that you get in, there there's another exception as well. Um, some of um, AC Medical affiliates that we very strategically pick, and we have conversations with, and we have historical data with that that they've helped our members that matched in in transitional that helped them get into one of their own PGY2s, again, it has to be somebody who messed up. It has to be a spot that becomes open. They can't just create a spot for you. And they, they help them get in. But again, you could imagine what a, what a unique circumstance that is. So remove that from the equation. Remove you know, three years of preliminary. You got to apply the categorical. Let's say that you don't and you do this and you get into preliminary. You have to immediately, this year, you have to get back into the match again. And so while you're a resident, you have to go through this whole process again and apply and, you know, be on your A game and be sharp and, and not mess up in residency and still apply. And, and then you have to kind of uh, think about the, uh, the equilibrium of, of the team that you're a part of and what do you tell them, what do you not tell them. But again, if that happens, please don't try to navigate this yourself. Um, join AC Medical and, and become a member so that we can, we can kind of walk you through these processes and, and we can become your behind the scenes uh, mentors. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't care about the publicity. We just want to make sure that, you know, that we're your advocate and you don't get bullied during residency. And, and that's really important to us. And there's a lot of opportunities for that to happen uh, if you find yourself in a situation like that. So under normal circumstances, this would not be my recommendation because most of the people that do this, they haven't really done it correctly from the beginning because their ERS application is not focusing on an advanced specialty. So they're just applying to preliminary because you know they, they, they sound like they're begging and these residencies don't want anybody who's desperate. So yeah, I, I don't recommend that you do this and usually prelim and transitional usually doesn't lead to a category, usually does not. Uh, is it better than not doing anything? Yes, but, but you know, you gotta be ready for what to do next. Like you gotta have the, 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 the the stamina and fortitude to 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 push forward and, and do everything that I just mentioned to you. So it's tough. We can have more conversations about this in a bit. Next is uh, you know where did you apply to already? You can reapply to programs that you've already applied to, right? You, you all know that. Uh, the question really becomes whether you should apply to a program that you were rejected and they had an unfilled spot. You know, I would probably want to see what are all my other options. I would probably want to see how many uh, slots they have unfilled. If this is a program that I was rejected in, and I don't know a reason why, and they only have like maybe less than, you know, maybe three or less uh, unfilled spots. Um, and I have a lot of other options where there's like 10 spots unfilled and there's multiple programs like that. I probably wouldn't apply to them if they rejected me. If I interviewed at that location and they now have an unfilled spot, that tells me that they didn't rank me. Because if I rank, if I interview and I rank them and they have an unfilled spot, that means I was not on the rank order list. You should not be applying to that program. If you have not heard back from the program, then yes, you should apply to them. However, 
there is there's there's more to it than that. You it behooves you to look at the total number of unfilled spots per program. And you know, generally kind of what works is is you kind of uh, you know, programs that have the highest number of unfilled, you know, probably you know they're 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 hearing from the hospital CEO and and the integrity of that program director is coming up the question a lot by a lot of people. And so they're pretty embarrassed. They don't want to they don't want to risk it. So they're they're making some decisions pretty rapidly. So go with the highest to lowest. They may just even make a single phone call to you, ask whether you're 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 serious about their program and and that will be it. And so the the more stress that they're under, the more um, uh, peculiar that they're going to act. And uh, uh, and so uh, take a take a uh, look at how many unfilled spots there are. And again, you'll see that when you log into your R three system. In um, when you log into your R three system, the the, the during match week. Initially, the the number of unfilled it's it's an administrative process, and so the the, the residency coordinator does have to make sure that. Uh, that they've entered the correct number of spots to begin with, and then uh, at the end, uh, if there's any left over, that they're going to have to remove it. So uh, for the most part, uh, it's it's pretty accurate. It becomes a little bit uh, less reliable towards the end of the fourth round of soap because if uh, you know if they may say that there's an unfilled spot and and they really don't have it or they pulled it and they're just not updating uh, NRMP's database, and which makes it look like they have an unfilled spot but they don't. But for the purposes of rounds. Not post rounds for purposes of rounds and the phone calls before the rounds, then then go with the highest symbols. Number eight, if you don't want to go with any of the before, the, the items that I mentioned, go with the gut feelings. Where do you feel like you'll be most happy in? You know, whether it's a dream match, um, it may be realistic during so. Uh, a friend of mine, he um, uh, he matched into Brown, uh, and and he didn't even have a chance at, at at that place during the regular match cycle. But the reason why he was able to match is because he we during Scramble, we, we came and we supported them and we got some incredible people to get on the call phone and 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 recommend them directly to the program director and they overlooked a lot of his red flags. So your dream residency may be within reach during so. But the challenge is you cannot call them, you can just only apply 45 programs when they call you, then you can communicate with them. When you apply to them, if they don't call you back, you cannot communicate with them. And make sure you don't tell anybody that you didn't match because the people around us want to help us. And so what they may do is they may go out and call, call let's say that you have a, an uncle who's a hospitalist and you, you know and you're 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 you didn't match and you tell the uncle and the uncle's like you know what i got this covered or maybe they may not even not even tell you that but you may go out and contact the residency program and and uh, say look i have a, a nephew or niece that didn't match and can you get him a spot and god forbid they gives them uh, your name to look up your ERAS application and that program can record you and you had nothing to do with it, uh, but the program you would be under investigation by NRMP because you most likely have told your uncle that uh, you didn't match, and that's how he knew, and that's why he was working on your behalf. Whether you gave him permission or not is, is irrelevant. So nobody can call on your behalf. So uh, just keep that in mind. So my gut feeling, it's not bad, uh, but again, during so tools are quite different. Visa sponsorship, we we see this um, happen a lot. Question is, who do you, you know, which database do you re rely, uh, whether a program does sponsor these or not? You know, during SOAP, I have no choice but to rely on on um, on a database, and and uh, and and the one that I rely on is Frida. Uh, and so you can go to Frida. It does say whether they sponsor visas or not. That's not always the case. I, I know I can't I can't tell you I can have a countless number of cases where. The program said we do not sponsor visas, and they gave the person an interview, and the person matched, and they sponsored this visa. And they still on the website they said we don't sponsor visas. So how is that? Uh, you know, every program in the United States can sponsor visa. Every residency program, every fellowship program can sponsor it, and they can co-sponsor co it with ETFMD. Uh, the question is whether they want to go through it. What do you do during your soap? You only get 45 programs. Again, I have no choice. You got to rely on the database, and you don't want to waste those 45 programs. So maybe you focus on um, on you know as you have your EMS open, you have your NRMP open, you have your Frida right there in the middle too. If you need visa sponsorship, and you open it up, and um, you know if it says we don't sponsor visas, and you open up the website and you see residents from you know, all around the world, the chances of of resident of uh, you know, people that have gone to medical school all around the world uh, of, of none of them needing visa sponsorship. If you see that everybody's from the Caribbean, and most likely they're U.S. citizens, and not, them not sponsoring these is probably correct. So you got to kind of, got to take it to the train. So, uh, 
let's look at other factors. Uh, proximity to home. Uh, I know that for our California and New York uh, colleagues, it's uh, it's uh, well, really any state. It's it's important you know, to be around family. So proximity to home uh, may be maybe a factor. And the same reason why programs like to uh, hire residents and, and rank residents from the same state uh, much higher. The programs right there will tell you that in, in your face. Uh, a lot of them do uh, have preferential uh, treat. They do have. They do. Uh, there's preferential treatment for people from their state. Uh, so trend uh, this year. So when when you find out on Monday uh, where where do each one of these specialties stand and what is the trend this year, then and of course that that could completely change everything we talked about and, and you may need to change your strategy. Uh, your letters of recommendation. Um, let's say that you have you you know, you've committed to one specialty. Uh, you know, all match cycle and all your letters of recommendation specifically say, you know, I, I recommend you know, Pedro Mazzani to I don't know, uh, pediatrics. And 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 Pedro Mazzani doesn't match into pediatrics. And so last minute, I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's try family medicine. True story. <laughs> and so, you know, you try family medicine and all the letters of recommendation that you had say, I recommend it to pediatrics. What are you going to do? You can't take. You, know, you can't take pediatric letters of recommendation and put them in front of family medicine programs. Uh, you have no choice. But you have no choice. You have a couple of choices. You have a couple of weeks right now to review these letters of recommendation. Um, I never recommend that you waive your right if you're not a U.S. medical senior. You gotta you gotta take a look at these letters and and the the value of of um, you know, having access and knowing what's the content of these letters, especially in a, in a moment like this where you need to know are they recommending you to a specific specialty or not. Um, and so it's really important. Uh, so you know, so you you you've got to uh, you got to know what the content of those letters are. So the content of your letters is, is going to determine what specialty you apply to, which programs you apply to. Number one, number two, you know, by your ERAS, that's going to also determine uh, which uh, specialty that you apply to. Because if you certified your application and your your ERAS, and there's there's absolutely you you are your member of let's say American College of Physicians, and now you want to switch over to pediatrics. So if that's internal medicine to pediatrics, uh, you know, so that could that could play a role. Uh, but you know, a couple of weeks right now to, to get your letters, let the let the letter writers know that you know you're applying to unfilled programs and they need these applications on the spot. And so you want to unwaive your 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 right to see these letters and see what they say. But is it realistic to expect them to change these letters with only you know less than two weeks uh, before? So probably uh, probably unrealistic. Uh, and if you have any other strategies that, that you like to use uh, or you've heard of using, please go ahead and, and uh, mention it in chat over here and, and we'll, and we'll uh, discuss them. So everything that we just discussed, you know, hopefully you, you saw the trend, which is preparing for that call and making sure that that call goes successful. It's going to most likely be calls. Uh, they may send an email, but most likely it's going to be a call. So that means that you have to have a phone that is just you know open. So one of the things you could potentially do is if somebody's calling you on 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 one phone line, maybe you have another second phone, and ask them, can I can I can you can I can you stay on the phone here and can I call you on on this other line, and see what um, you know what they say. That's probably gonna you know they're probably not gonna want to do that because they'll know that you're kind of waiting on other programs and no program wants to be put in second place. So that's kind of a tough situation to be in. But you have to kind of keep the conversation positive without making it too much. Um, it's going to go very fast. These phone calls are are quick, uh, and they'll you know they'll they'll listen to your tone, they'll listen to your response, they'll they'll see how you speak and whether that matches your application and how you put it together. Which is the reason why in our membership and all our document editing, uh, we don't rewrite everything in our words unless you've signed up for drafting. If we want it to be in your words, and then we we edit it because we want to make sure you can defend it and it all sounds um, like you. Uh, program director may be on the uh, on that call. He, he or she may be the one calling you, and uh, there's a lot higher focus on on red flags um, and uh, and asking you potentially why do you think even so. And uh, so create a spreadsheet. Uh, our, our previous um, our previous webinar that we just posted on our YouTube channel has uh, a two live interactive uh, candidates anonymously that shared their rank order list and uh, and shared that with us. And a lot of those same factors that you see there. Uh, you can answer them and create your own spreadsheet about why you apply to these 45 programs. So when they call you, you can just go through the spreadsheet and you have a positive conversation with them so you're not you know, dumbfounded uh, when they call you. So with that being said, let me go ahead and take a look and see what questions are asked during uh, in, in our chat. All right, Dr. Uh, Nada, you go ahead and please unmute yourself, please.
Yes, I had a kind of like very specific question. I'm not sure. Um, so I had two of the doctors that I did rotations with tell me that they've uploaded the LORs, but it's not showing on my heiress. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's on my end or if I was supposed to do something different. I'm not sure what to do. Um, and I don't want to contact them again to ask because they already said that they uploaded it and it was like two months ago. So uh, if I understand your question uh, correctly, you've done your rotations with them and they mm -hmm. uploaded the letters of recommendation. Did you waive mm -hmm. your right to see these letters? No. Okay. And you sent them uh, an LOR request form and uh, they went ahead and uploaded themselves. Did you ask them to send it to you? So you uploaded yourself? No. I Should see. I have them do that now? Like, should I just tell them to send it to me because it's not showing up on the um, on the portal? Oh, so it's not showing up on the portal at all? No, not at all. Oh, oh yes, of course. Yeah, just you got to. Um, are you telling them that it's not showing up on the portal? Yes, I did. But at the time they had sent it like I just finished my last rotation. So it was like a month ago last time I touched bases with them. And I thought maybe it was a time thing. Like I had to wait two weeks for it to show. And now it's been over a month, like almost two months. So then I thought like now would be an appropriate time to, um, you know, to yeah. figure out what happened. Yeah. So those those are if you don't see it on, on if you don't see it as uh, if it's still pending, then, then they have not done it. So, yeah, yeah. You, you, you got it. You got it. You got to get in touch with the attending and say, look, just send me a copy of it and I'll just upload it again because it was okay. either not accepted or it's not there. Uh, oh, okay. but you got to have that sense of urgency with them. But okay. um, you don't want to sound like you're pestering them either. It's a tough situation to be in. Hopefully they'll understand. Uh, hopefully they'll understand. Um, I have another question. So yes, I have a, a third one as well that I had put in the portal um, and I put it as like expecting it from this uh, doctor. And I did send the request to this doctor, but um, I haven't gotten a reply. And every time I call, I only reach like the MA or the, um, you know, the office staff. So I was thinking, could I, because I've done five rotations, I was wondering if I could remove it, if it was possible to remove her and put another doctor instead. If the letter is not there, uh, what, yeah. are you saying that you were able to assign an, an, a, a letter that has not been uploaded to programs? It's not, I didn't assign the letter. I put, they, they make you put the name of the physician before, so that they could send the request to them. Oh, I so I put the name and I sent her the request, but I haven't been able to reach her. Um, and I've called at least four times. So my, my recommendation is that the, the whole request for letter writer uh, mm -hmm. to, to write your letter, that, that document, I think it's, it's uh, redundant and it really causes uh, more trouble when it comes to you getting a copy of that letter. What I would do is I would just contact the physician and say, you know, uh, you can go ahead and send the letter of recommendation to me directly and I'll go ahead and upload it. And um, and then you just log into LOR portal and you get the document ID and you enter it and then you upload it as the as the physicians as the physicians designee. But make sure you let them know to, to not write in the letter that you waived your right to see it, because if it says you waived your right to see it and you upload it yourself, then that that could get you disqualified. Okay, but I have not been able to reach her. Is there a way for me to remove her and I replace would, it with another doctor? Yeah, yeah, you, but you don't even need to worry about that. You would just go and create another document. Oh, okay. I thought there was four maximum. So that oh no, no, no. You could. It's oh. unlimited number of documents. You just ah, you can. Okay. Uh, yeah, you can attach uh, up to four letters to uh, per program, and uh, that oh. and that brings me to to one of the points. If you already applied to a program that happens to be unfilled and you submitted four letters already, you can't you can't submit more to them if they happen to be unfilled. So um, so just kind of keep that in mind. I haven't applied to any programs yet, so I don't think it'll be a problem. But okay. I also had that other question that today is the deadline. Um, like the NRMP keeps emailing about submitting a rank order list, but I'm pretty sure they just mean for the main match, right? It doesn't apply to me that it's applying only to SOAP. Yeah, so if you don't have any programs to rank, yeah. there's nothing for you to you know, certify. Yeah, uh, that's why I was confused. Yeah, so uh, back, back in the days when I was a little bit more paranoid, I would just pick uh, any program and I would just certify it and uh, just to make sure that I submitted and I certified it. So if you if you want to do that, you can. Uh, it, it doesn't hurt. Does that help me at all? No, it doesn't help, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I probably won't do that. Though. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. No problem. Great questions. All right. So our uh, next is uh, uh, attendee MM. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Oh, hi. Sorry for that. Okay. My name is Moreno. Hi, Moreno. Nice to meet you. <laughs> hi. Well, what I would like to know is I know I'm not supposed to get in touch with the program during soap week, but would it be uh, worth to try to get in touch, like email them beforehand, saying that in case they end up going to soap, that I would be very much interested in it, or and maybe attach my my CV on that email. Is that something that is worth or legal to be done? Legal, yes, it is worth it. You know, you gotta. I mean, worth is, is is relative. I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to just kind of be on on the radar in case they go unfilled. But it, they don't really think like that. Uh, they don't think you know we had we had this individual that emailed us and let's go ahead and go to that person. They will look at the people that have applied to them and, and based on the queue that they have and and what they have in their application. So if you if you do this right now and let's say that you have not applied to them or let's say that uh, they rejected you or or you interviewed there already, uh, that could pose some problems because if you didn't apply to them and now you're messaging them and in case that they're unfilled to kind of keep you on the top of their list, that's kind of weird. And uh, and and again, it doesn't, they, we don't, we don't, they don't have time to think like this. So the, the best way that, and I'm not sure where your, your ERS is, if you certified it or not, what your letters of recommendation look like, what does it say? You got to kind of look at it as if, if I'm a family medicine or an internist medicine or pathology program looking at this application, does it make sense? Are, are all the letters recommending me to the specialty or is it is it special diagnostic? Um, you know, you, you got you to gotta just kind of think about it like that. But calling them beforehand uh, preemptively, I, I don't see any benefit in, in that at all. Um, it's just gonna, it kind of makes you feel like you're kind of uh, taking some proactive measures, but it's really not doing anything, you know, which, which also brings me to the, uh, the whole concept of letter of intent and letter of interest. Uh, when, after you, you apply to programs already, there is no such a thing, you know, as far as a letter of intent or letter of interest, you've already expressed your interest in those programs by applying to them. The, the reason why I don't like to, to, to have, uh, the conversation of letter of intent is because usually people take that in their entire personal statement and they they, they uh, retype the whole thing in that email. It's more of a follow up. So if you've had communication, if you did your if you did everything correctly throughout the interview process and you communicated with the programs, you did the second communication and you um, you know you ask them you you send them emails that that were short, brief, a purposeful, and uh, with a question for them to answer and they answered it. You know that's a really good way to have another follow-up. So this is a, a series of follow-ups is what what you should have been doing. Um, so again, there's a lot that I don't know what you did during the interview um, regular interview cycle. So it's kind of uh, hard for me to give any more specific recommendation to you. But to, for your original question, I don't see how that could help in any way. And make sure you don't have somebody calling on your behalf that because you could be a match violation uh, during soap. Uh, that doesn't mean you cannot call the programs after they call you. You can call them. But it does mean that you can't even, you know, you cannot even call programs that don't participate in SOAP. So you can't call programs that do participate in SOAP. You can't even call programs that don't participate in SOAP because you're in SOAP. If you accepted that and you're you're in, in SOAP, then you got to remain in SOAP and you got to abide by those policies. All right. Okay. May I do a second question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, um, I did apply for uh, general surgery, focusing on mostly preliminary spots because I'm an old graduate. Um, if I, I applied for a, a different specialty, even though my letters of recommendation are towards general surgery and my ERAS is all towards general surgery because it's, it, I cannot do that because I'm already a general surgeon elsewhere. Could I just uh, be able to only in the personal statement address why I change it? Like, but all of your letters are saying they're recommending you. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're all saying, yeah. Then then that doesn't no. Um, th then that 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 undermines your own credibility uh, because you know then they're going to know that if if you were so committed to this specialty 
especially that you were so committed to, you're willing to just cut ties with it, you know, within 24 hours and completely switch it, then you then then they have no chance if you're unhappy in that specialty and you get started. So I wouldn't do that. Um, I and, and there's going to be a lot of surgery prelims, so you're probably going to be okay uh, just applying to surgery prelim, and has, unless you have another reason why you want to switch specialties. No, okay. I'm just afraid so, of not getting anything. Yeah, and and you know, um, yeah, we all should be, and and but we we got to kind of be afraid of it way before we even start the application process. Uh, mm -hmm. But right now, I think you know from what I'm hearing, I would probably just let you know to 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 focus on general surgery prelim, and um, you know, see how many categoricals come up. There's probably not going to be that many, but uh, but uh, focus should be on general surgery prelim. They, the general surgery is one of the only exceptions that that they uh, they give a prelim position to to individuals, not because they have an advanced, like say anesthesiology. They do it because they need manpower and woman power to to fill an unfilled position when it becomes needed. So they just immediately, the same day, you can take somebody from prelim and put them in categorical. That's the reason why these surgery programs uh, don't mind you uh applying and, and then placing you in, in their surgery positions and some pretty good surgery positions become available but again it's prelim it's prelim and, and by the way don't call yourself an old graduate uh you're 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 undermining so much that you've done so uh, thus far you know you're probably even younger than me but uh you know the be always in a fresh mindset and you know your age has very little to to do with it unless you keep reminding yourself that i'm i'm old and i can't compete the first thing that you all have to do is realize and accept who's your number one competition. Who do you think is your number one competition? Wow. I think it's like freshly graduated people. Uh, good, but good uh, I, attempt. I agree. I, I actually, I really don't think I'm old. I have like the stamina to go. I, I, and I, I really love surgery and I do have experience, so that should be the opposite. It should be valued if I was well, to be a program director. Well, actually, but, as a program director, they're probably going to worry whether you're teachable. Yeah, absolutely, and I would too. Um, so, and so, so, gladly, uh, I know some of the 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 writers from my my lawyers. They they did write that that I'm a teachable person, but. Uh, even though I, I didn't get an interview, so I would uh, I would I would um, uh, you know I would want to see your entire application package. Uh, uh, I, I would want to dissect everything. I would want to dissect the letters and and see where they're coming from and and what are they writing about you and and uh, really trying to figure all of that out. Um, uh, how many programs did you apply to, by the way? About a hundred. Oh, that's not even enough. <laughs> First oh, that mistake. Doesn't even that doesn't even tip the needle. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, but but again, you know, I, I'm not sure if your application was worth investing more than that in. So a lot a lot that goes into it. But again, I just wanted to make sure that you're, you know, you you kind of uh, emphasizing on, on you having had been a surgeon doesn't necessarily improve your odds because it's hard to teach an existing surgeon how, you know, a particular program likes to do surgery they want to be able to be on that that teaches they don't want usually somebody that comes in and and uh, already knows it all so how you presented yourself in the application what titles you chose for yourself in eras are all critical like if you if the word attending physician was used anywhere if you had like let's say residents under you or medical students under you and you say that look i've already done all of this right i've already done all of this and uh you know look how much of this experience i already have and you should i should i'm going to be an asset to you uh, to them they're going to be well if you weren't attending already and i'm going to bring you in as a pgy1 and my pgy2 just graduated from med school well they're going to have a pretty tough time communicating with somebody who's been an attending already and is one level lower than them so so th the way you described yourself in your eras is really critical and your letters of recommendation i'm not sure who they were and what capacity you you got these letters from but somebody with so much experience and, and you haven't had been a surgeon already, my question would be, did they treat you in these clinical rotation as if you were a colleague or they treated you as a medical student and they really had high demands of you? So the content of these letters is critical. Um, so just to kind of address potentially some of the reasons why you haven't had any interviews. I see. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, go with Mahi Ken. You can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, please. 
Thank you for raising Hi, Dr. Mirzani. Thank you Hi, for the nice informative webinar. It was very, very, I enjoyed every moment of it, especially. Oh, like thank you. you. Thank you. You're too kind. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> I always uh, appreciate your time that you spent with me here. So thank you. Yes. Um, so, Doctor, I had a few questions. My first one was that will we, a will, will, uh, will we be able to edit our application or will it be the same one that we submitted in September? If you certified it, it's locked. You can't change it other than the, the initial biographical information page. Okay. Um, also, Doctor, so last year when I applied, my year of graduation was three years. So now when I apply for so, will it be four years? Well, you can't change that either. So it's... I guess we're a year ahead, uh, but mm -hmm. three to four, I, I don't think that's going to be that big of a deal. But technically speaking, uh, sure, yes, I suppose that would be the case. So should I apply to programs uh, uh, that have a cutoff for like less than five years graduation or should I like shoot my shot and opt for the three year one? You know, the the, the rules during SOAP are, are out at the window. and. Mm -hmm. You know, it was those whatever policy these programs had and, and uh, whatever standardized criteria they used to to weed people out is what got them in trouble to begin with. And yeah. so, you know, so most likely they're not going to make the same mistakes again. Um, my recommendation to you is to apply to programs based on where you have, you know, all the, the factors that I mentioned to you, where you've mm -hmm. done rotation, where you have a support system where, um, you know, start with the, the highest number of unfilled to, to lowest. And apply that way uh, rather than you know whether they're IMG friendly or um, um, you know or or uh, uh, whether they have a year of graduation cutoff uh, mm -hmm. because clearly it didn't work for them. Yes. Um, also, doctor, my next question is: so I also am applying for prelim surgery. How do I find out which programs are toxic or malignant? And my main, as a visa requiring applicant, my main concern is to find out where did the previous prelims match? Like, did they match into categoricals or did the PDs help them or any other faculty? I'm so sorry. So there was a portion that I didn't hear. Are you asking what, how do you find out about uh, whether the program sponsors visas? No, uh, so uh, I will be applying for general surgery yes. prelims. So my main concerns are like, how do I find out which program program is toxic or oh. malignant? And the main concern for me is that to find out how do I find out previous prelims? Like where have they matched? Have they matched into categoricals? And were the PDs helpful or even any other faculty? Like did they vouch for them um, or they, did they just leave them? Um, usually the, the, those programs don't help in, in moving from prelim to advanced because by definition, you should have already had your advanced set up when you were ranking those prelims. So the program is, has no responsibility and or, or they have no time to, to help you move forward. Now, whether they want to write you a letter of recommendation is purely on them. And, and your relationship with them. Um, and, and you could probably get that, even probably from the program director. And uh, because if you disclose to them appropriately that I'm coming to this prelim, not because I have an advanced specialty in mind, but because look, I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna do such a great job that you're, if there's an unfilled position, you'll, you'll fit me in. Then the program director is not gonna be upset when they make you an offer and you accept, accept it. Team uh, recommending you, yes, that can happen. And that does usually happen based on their exposure with you. Another really good question you asked is how do I find out if a program has been malignant? Most of the cases for residents being terminated or uh, resigned or forced to resign or forced to transfer, transfer uh, most of those are pretty private and you know they're they're sealed and uh, unless you know you're you're part of the attorney uh, uh, the, the firm that's represented that individual or you've been a part of that case you won't know what happened so you won't really know whether a program is malignant. There is one way that you could potentially tell though. Mm -hmm. If you look at the total number of residents from one year to next, and you see that, you know, they're supposed to have six residents every year. And uh, first year when, and the PGY1 hasn't even finished, they're already down to, let's say, four from six, right. and something happened. Or if you see there's six in PGY1, there's five in PGY2, then mm -hmm. something happened. And so you can kind of look at the total numbers and see, you know, what's, what's happened there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is there's there's malignant people in every residency and so you mm -hmm. you just have to uh, you got to be prepared for them and you gotta you gotta you gotta be ready for those bullies and uh and you can't do it by just by trying to you know stand up for yourself and 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 think that there's labor laws 
you got to do it by making sure that you don't make mistakes and and that mm-hmm. you're confident and you understand how the how the, how, the, how to be an employee in the United States, um, which you know it's a whole different conversation. But if you're worried about those things, I, I would probably think that you're you know you 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 know something is taken away from your confidence, and uh, I'm not sure if it's because of not enough recent clinical exposure or maybe not being in tough enough clinical rotations where you'd be really challenged to to really, really have to answer to some of the the, the, the tougher personalities. Um, one of the things that, that we do at AC Medical and, you know, not all of our, you know, more veteran graduates like and can handle is when I speak with them, I'm not always the nicest, kindest person that you can you can find. Like in webinars, I'm a whole different, a whole different bargain. But if, if I only get five, 10 minutes with, with, with someone and I'm, and I'm speaking with them, I, I kind of put them under pressure and most of them break and they don't want to talk to me anymore. And, and if that happens, that's a pretty good sign that they're going to have a tough time in residency because, because I am nothing compared to what some of these people can do. The stakes here is, you know, that's it. We're not talking to Zani anymore in residency. It's, you know, being put on probation and dismissed. So Maybe the, the 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 issue is that you haven't been in enough scenarios where you you have to deal with really challenging personalities and kind of working yourself through it to not worry about that um, mm-hmm. because it, it can happen in any program. Right. It can happen in the best or the easiest programs. You just gotta yeah. you just gotta know how to communicate and work through troubles and just just watch out for certain people. Uh, which is, by the way, the reason why I transferred from PGY one to PGY two from my from Floyd to, to Morehouse is because I had issues with, with a couple of people like that, but I had some pretty good mentors and they taught me what to do. And, and, um, I, I avoided being kicked out. Wow, so, doctor. um, so thank you for that question. Yeah. yeah thank you for your work. Does that kind of make sense? Does it? Yes. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Doctor. It was a wonderful perspective. Okay. okay. Yeah. Also, doctor, okay. my last wonderful. question Great. is, um, yes. Should yes. I opt for university programs for prelim or community programs? I don't have any geographical ties. I don't mind anywhere. The main uh, concern for me is to match into a category. Why? Okay, why are you applying to prelim then? I I believe, doctor, I do have a red flag. I didn't have research in my application when I submitted it. So I think I am far behind when it comes to, uh, when I compare myself with other applicants. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. What specialty is this? General surgery. Okay. So surgery does, um, you know, they do, you know, <laughs> excuse me, they do favor research, uh, you know, a little bit more than others, but it's not, it's not their top um, priority. So it's, it's somewhere around 45, 50% of the program directors look for it. And uh, the importance is, uh, you know, it's relative. It's somewhere around the same as USMLE scores. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if that is necessarily the reason, you know, well, actually let's, uh, Let's take a look and see if that could potentially be the reason. And uh, we'll, we'll try to have data answer this question. Let's take a look. Mm-hmm. So this is the NRMP's website. Again, we're going to go back to uh, data reports. We're going to look at charting matches and outcomes by international medical graduates. And we're mm-hmm. going to look at surgery. So surgery, let's go ahead and scroll down over here. We're going to look for research. All right. Research. research. Okay. So number of research projects of international medical graduates. So mm-hmm. blue and green. This is IMGs. This is non-US IMGs. Um, those with none, 15 did not match, nine matched. With mm-hmm. one, 21 didn't match, 10 matched. With two, 26 did not match, 13 matched. Three, mm-hmm. five or more, 20 did not match, nine matched. Um, I don't like, so whenever you see like the, the, the blue and the green come at a, at a, at a, you know, at, at an equal point and then the blue mm-hmm. goes up, that's usually, you know, that's the tipping point. I don't see that anywhere here. Um, and, uh, you know, you, for example, you see, you know, with one research, uh, two research, maybe two research, but, and, and, you know, uh, this research is really research and publication Two maybe is the, is the magic number, but with mm-hmm. still we're seeing. Uh, kind of about the same number of unmatched, even with really high number of research. So, not really sure if research is 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 actually the weakness in your application. Wow, doctor, thank you for this. <laughs> yeah, my okay. pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, thanks for sharing all of this. Yeah, thank a lot you. that goes into it, huh? Yeah, my pleasure, yeah. my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right. It's okay. Uh, MM, I, did you raise your hand again or did I just forget to uh, lower your hand? Yes, I did. Sorry. Oh, sure. No problem. No, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, well, um, I want to ask something else. You said there is a um, time sensitivity uh, on the applications. Um, since we can only find out which programs are going to have available spots on the 13th, can I take like my time to research all the programs that day and apply later in that day so that they're going to be able to access us on the 14th? Or is is like a, a northern enough application that they would consider and I should apply 11 o'clock or as soon as I find out what are they well, doing? Let me let me ask you this what would you be researching if you you know if you had an extra four or five hours well i think i would research um which are these programs which of them have advanced like if they have general surgery and other specialties if there is um in the same town a program that my husband would be able to join as a dentist this kind of stuff Okay, uh, some of what you said, I could I could understand. It sounds like you know you probably you know you probably have a little bit more conversations to have with your husband about about where you potentially could um, you know find the residency position and and, and you know the, his level of flexibility. I'm not sure about, but that's that's uh, I, I am sensitive to that, and that's always a very very tough conversation to have. So, um, but but it is a conversation to to be had. I think that you finding a residency is, if any, he's already a dentist. Uh, again, I could be oversimplifying this, but he can probably set up shop anywhere if he's already a licensed dentist versus you finding a residency anywhere. So, uh, you know, I guess the order of priority is, is important, number one. Number two, if it's preliminary, we're really probably looking at just one year of commitment until you, you know, find your PGY2 and maybe two years of commitment. If it's like our, our other member, it could be three years of commitment. Uh, but most likely it's one year of commitment. Uh, it's not a permanent thing. So, uh, you know, the family's kind of got to work together on that. But again, that's, you're kind of limited in, in, in what you research and what you, um, uh, what your re options are, because it depends on how many general surgery prelims there are going to be. So if I look oh, at last year, there was 160 programs with preliminary spots in the soap. Yeah. So I see you teach you what. Yeah, I see. So, so it was actually so it was 145, pretty close. 144 the year before. I think. I think what I would do if I were you, I would just first write down right now all the all the factors that that we have over here. And and for for all of you, I, I'm more than happy to go back and you know then kind of just so that you can write them down because the recording is not going to be available for quite some time. So number one, if you remember, so strategy notes and recommendation number two, where you have your social support system, just write these down on a spreadsheet and start to fill in where these are and what states those would be. Uh, three, you know, again, this is state. So you pick the states where you have social support system, uh, click uh, the states where you've done a clinical experience in, um, and those right there. So that research for you should be pretty, pretty, uh, that should narrow it down a lot because it's not gonna take much to get to 45 programs. And then so, uh, so that's by state. And um, by specialty, you already know, it's gonna be general surgery prelim. And uh, category, it's going to be prelim. Um, and uh, six, you apply to 100 programs. So uh, there's probably, I don't know, maybe about 250 to 300 prelims. So you're probably going to be OK. Maybe you applied to some, maybe you haven't. Uh, you just have to keep track of who rejected you and not apply to those. Or uh, the, I think the other two it doesn't uh, impact you. And you could pretty rapidly weed out programs that only have one or two openings. Now, if you, have, if, you, if you see a program that has one or two openings and, and you have a really good social support system and you just feel really good about it to apply, yeah, you have 45 programs. Go ahead and, 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 and apply to them. I, I don't think you should ignore your gut feeling, but it's got to be, you got to be realistic with it. So if it's a gut feeling where you feel like, look, I've, I've done rotations in, in the sister hospital and, and my, my brother lives there and, and there's an opening there, I can make a pretty good case uh, as to why I've applied here. So hopefully they'll see all of that one of the 45 goes to them. So, and, um, you know, visa sponsorship, which I'm not sure if you need or not. So that process doesn't take the whole day. That takes, you know, that just takes, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes to do. Mm -hmm. I see. So, so be, because you, you don't have that many options. As soon as you, as soon as you, you kind of weed out 
those programs that have like, you know, five, 10 unfilleds, mm-hmm. that kind of, that, that does a lot of the, the research for you already. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Great question. All right. So, okay. Uh, Ghani, you have your, your hand raised. Yes. I wanted to ask you when you apply first, thank you so much for doing this session. When you apply, you. Uh, when you apply for the SOAP programs, what programs can, what can you attach to the application? Because last year I was not quite ready, but I applied anyway. And my understanding is uh, from last year's experience, you only the application went, so nothing else. Well, when you, so you have to go back to ERAS and then you pick your 45 programs and you have to attach the documents in ERAS and then submit them. Well, uh, I, I'm not quite sure. I think last year was not, you couldn't attach anything. It's just you the could. application. No, you could. I see. Thank you. Yeah, and, my pleasure. Uh, the other thing I um, added uh, after in writing uh, about the policy and restrictions about contacting programs. So I have a wide network of mostly people I did research with. So during this whole week, uh, let's say, my mentor is now in Texas and there is an opening in his hospital, although not in his apartment. Could I contact my mentor? Could he make a call for me? Or what are the red lines here which one should be very, very careful about? What you just mentioned is a red line. As tempting as it is and as close to home as it is, uh, that cannot happen because they, they, the program could uh, could literally take that and, and report that to uh, NRMP and that would put you in match violation. And match violation could mean anywhere between a year to five years, a lifetime ban from, from the match. So it's not worth it, number one. Number two, you know, emphasis on research is, is, is really over, overdone. Um, so I'm not really sure how much will a residency program listen to a, a primary investigator and how much pull they got. Um, but again, it, it's, you know, it, every person has a different uh, level of, uh, um, you know, pull in each facility, but to, to answer your question again, you, you should not be doing that. You got to keep it to yourself. I probably wouldn't tell anybody that you did not match because they're all going to want to try to help you and you got to do this on your own. That's the match policy. And uh, so and basically we submit 45 programs and just wait. You submit, you wait, you make sure that you don't fall asleep. You check your email, you you have your phone is fully charged. You have a backup phone. You have, you know, you update your all the phone numbers. You get a second phone. You get a third cell phone. You put all of those in in the biographical information section of ERAS, and um, you don't you 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 hope that you don't miss phone calls. Uh, and what I would probably do is I would probably get a fresh number uh, that that like family and friends don't have just for soap because you don't want to be on a call with mom or dad who doesn't want to get off the phone and is really worried about your future. And you miss a call from a program that just got your application. And uh, in the link that you shared, and I'm sorry for taking so long, Not it said that uh, on the 13th, you can basically apply in non soap non match programs. What are those non soap non match programs? Well, on the, oh, no, 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 no. Um, on the 13th, you cannot apply to non soap non match programs. Uh, if you decide to participate in soap, you know, by not pulling yourself out of the match, you are in SOAP. So you cannot call any program at all on the 13th. You can only apply to 45 programs through ERAS. That's it. And you got to sit back. Thank you so much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great questions. All right. Let's try this again. Is it, uh, am I saying it correctly? Uh, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Let's see if this works. Hello, doctor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Ah. Great. Yeah. Great. Hello, doctor. Um, thank you so much for this Bye-bye. presentation and for Bye-bye. asking all the questions. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, if I applied on Monday for all the 45 programs, so then uh, on the day of the, on Thursday, on the rounds, when the rounds started, so I have nothing actually to do, just wait for any offers if I am interviewed already. Is that right? Or there are some applicants to do something between the rounds like well i uh, what i would do is if you receive phone calls mm-hmm. um even one you um you know you want to kind of 
you don't want to leave that phone call without knowing what's going to happen next. So you want to kind of keep that line of communication open. So don't just, you know, sit back and, oh, I was really interested. And now we'll probably say, okay, so what happens next? Um, you know, how do, how do we communicate with one another? You know, what if I get an offer from another program and I really need to speak with you because I really like your program, uh, okay. whether I got to accept that or not. So you want to kind of leave that line of communication open. So maybe, you know, there's a one in five chance that the program director may give you his mobile number or her mobile number and, and, or the coordinator give, you know, some backdoor number. So that's how you want to kind of position yourself going into these uh, final days of, of uh, match week. Um, and if that happens, then, you know, maybe you'll, you know, at that point, if they've, if they've contacted you already, then you can call them. And especially okay. if you have that number, you can mm -hmm. call them and just say, Hey, listen, um, I don't know. I have an offer and I just wanted to talk with you before I accepted. I didn't get one from you. What, what is, what do, what do we do? And, uh -huh. you know, so. And do that before the, the rounds day. I mean, on Tuesday or on Wednesday, just. Well, it, it depends on what you're going to, well, yeah, the, well, to leave the conversation open would be when they call you. And, mm -hmm. uh, but during round day, you, you know, if it's before rounds, you don't want to say I have an offer because they just would know you're lying. Uh, but you know, this is during rounds is when, uh, uh -huh. when we can contact the pro we can contact the programs that we had an offer from to like communicate or discuss things between the rounds. Um, you, you can, accepting. you mm -hmm. can, if they called you, you can call them back. Uh, -huh. okay. Or, and or if for, they emailed you, you can, you can respond back to them. Mm -hmm. And for those who do not apply all the 45 programs on the first day, um, do they do that on the rounds day or? just the days before on Tuesday or Wednesday. I, because I don't know what, I don't know what they do. There's no logic in, in waiting mm -hmm. to apply later. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Like it's, so, you know, if they're so busy already, they're not going to be checking the inbox to see who else has applied. They're, yeah. they're getting thousands of, well, probably not thousands, maybe, but maybe thousands. Uh, they're getting hundreds of application on that moment. Why would they want to look at anybody else, you know, three, four days later? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah, my uh, pleasure. Yeah, my other question okay. is um, on the website, it's mentioned that uh, after the fourth round, an hour later, there are positions that will be left um, unfilled. And there, there, after an hour, we can contact those programs to apply for them. Yeah, so when SOAP ends, you can, you can start contacting any program. And, um, you know, these lists of unfilled programs, whatever remains, is... Um, you know people usually don't have any luck with them they usually don't pick up the phone they usually don't respond to any email there's more of a an administrative potentially it could be real but it could be administrative error that they just didn't remove they haven't removed that that slots availability from nrp's mm -hmm. soap but uh, but yeah technically speaking after 9 p.m eastern standard time you could contact these programs yeah but they don't do do anything like um response or it's not for filling these positions before the next day before uh, releasing the match i mean um, they won't respond if, if someone contacted them on thursday after the rounds you Is mean at 9 p.m uh, yeah after the fourth round if if they if, finish they're probably, they're probably yeah they're probably so exhausted at that point they don't want to talk to uh, anyone yeah. um but no, because, um uh, yes i'm listening yeah, yeah i i I, I, I'm not sure what they're going to do, but if there's any unfilled spots, you have to treat it as if, you know, this is real and until you get somebody on the phone, but emails are not going to work there. They usually don't respond to emails. You got to, you got to go after it with like phone calls and you got to be pretty aggressive until you get somebody on the phone uh, to talk with them after soap ends. Um, but uh, outside of that, there's no other rhyme or reason. Mm -hmm. And after the soap, we can contact those programs or email them. Um, you can and, contact any program. Uh -huh, and I, uh, uh, can I know what's the process to do that? I mean, through ERAS, uh, how, how uh, to send send the the ERAS application for those program or just a it's, CV or just it's getting on a phone call and and getting somebody on the phone and and saying you know you got an unfilled spot I'm I'm I still need a position and what do I have to do and uh -huh. they may have still the same process or it may be completely different so every program is going to be different so I I recommend that you. First, send an email, but then immediately follow up with a phone call, and you may need to do that eight, ten times until you get somebody on the on the call. Uh -huh. And we don't that we do that as part of the ERAS application, the same application with the ERAS. We have to do something different, or or we can use the oh. like the ERAS number or uh, ID. They can look it up, or they have access to it. 
if they want to check? Uh, yes. So they, they can, if you apply to them, then, then they can find you. But if you did not apply to them, they cannot find you. So uh, depends on that first. And then secondly, you can get their number. It's usually in ERAS. It is also on Frida. It is also on ACGME's yeah. website. So those those phone numbers are there, uh, mm -hmm. but it's also in in my ERAS on the program search. Okay, thank you so much, Doctor. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for you. your help. Thank you so much. My pleasure. No problem. All right, last question, and then. Sorry, it's me again. Okay, no, don't apologize, please. Um, uh, just to make sure, the phone calls are going to happen Tuesday and Wednesday, not Monday, right? Not Monday. They don't have any access to any applications on Monday. This is new for this year. Okay. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much for all the information. My pleasure. Thank you so much for all being here. And we kept a full house uh, throughout the, the, the webinar. That's always nice. Uh, so again, everyone, thank you so much for being here and, and all the best. Make sure that you certify your rank order list and, and today. And, um, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, uh, hopefully you're, we've, we've done everything that we could to, to get you ready for supplemental offer and acceptance program. We will not have another webinar until uh, match week is over. For all the AC Medical members, uh, we have a whole series of SOAP support. And when you go to AC Medical's website, there's a purple bar on top that, that directs you on, on how to get that support. And, and I, see, um, I see that there's, uh, there's several other questions over here. I, I'm not sure if, if we um, answered all of them. You know, while I got everybody here, let me, just, let me just take a look at these questions. I want to make sure that I answer them. Can we upload letters of recommendation ourselves? Yes, you can, if the letter of recommendation does not say that you waived your right to see it. Um, but yes, you can absolutely do it. You could be the, uh, the designee for the letter writer, as long as you have not waived your right to see it. Yep, it says if it's not waived. Yes, that is correct. Uh, well, uploading new letters of record, of course, that's one of the, the, the strategies to improve your chances, but depends on the, the letter. Uh, just uploading letters doesn't help. The content of the letter is important. If you're an AC Medical member, then, then we have a, your membership most likely has a free letter of recommendation analysis. So I suggest that you, uh, you sign up for that so we can take a look at the letter and tell you if it's going to help or not. And uh, we answered all the questions. So thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. We'll see you next time. Good luck. Bye-bye.